in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring, the first of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Frodo Baggins at the very beginning is having a conversation with Gandalf the Grey, the wizard, speaking of an encounter that his uncle Bilbo Baggins had with a despicable creature named Gollum who personifies the corruption of the ring. Gollum is completely enslaved by the ring with hatred for everything except the ring. Very treacherous, very vile, very despicable, and very miserable. And Frodo says to Gandalf of this encounter, it's a pity that Bilbo did not kill Gollum when he had the chance. To which Gandalf responds, it was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. And who knows, Gollum may yet have a part to play in what is to transpire, and when it happens, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. And we know in the end, it was not Frodo Baggins who was too weak-willed to destroy the ring, but it was Gollum who, having wrestled the ring from Bilbo's grasp, himself fell into the volcanic cracks of Mount Doom, killing himself and with him destroying the ring. In the end, Bilbo's pity spared Gollum to be the one who would destroy the ring, and in the end, Bilbo's pity ruled the fate of many. It's more than can be said for, for King David in today's first reading. It's kind of a midpoint in the second book of Samuel and the aftermath of David's great sin, his adultery with Bathsheba, and his murder of Uriah. Now, David is lacking in pity in the manner in which he murdered Uriah and stole his wife. But not only that, David is lacking even in pity for himself, as he unwittingly, having heard the parable that Nathan told him of the rich man and the poor man's lamb, declares that whoever the culprit is deserves death and that he will restore the lamb fourfold. Not realizing that he was lacking in mercy even for himself and was uttering a curse on himself until Nathan says, you are the man. And our first reading today is Nathan declaring God's sentence on David. Upon David's remorse, Nathan declares God's pity. A pity that David wouldn't even exercise for himself. The culprit of such a despicable parable. The culprit of the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And while God forgives David, the rest of the second book of Samuel, we see that fourfold curse of David playing itself out. He shall restore the lamb fourfold. The child he had by Bathsheba dies at birth. David's daughter Tamar is raped by her brother Ammon, who is murdered in vengeance by his brother Absalom, who was later assassinated by David's own people after a failed attempt to overthrow David's rule. The fourfold curse that David put on himself in his own lack of pity even in the face of his own sin. Very, very different story in today's Gospel, in which a despicable character throws herself at the feet of Jesus, an adulterous woman, for all we know, a woman of ill repute, and Jesus' pity of this woman. A pity that was very scandalous to those with him, not the least of which was his host, the Pharisee, and who knows what gossip ensued after this encounter. But Jesus exercised a pity toward the woman because of the great love and the great remorse she showed to him. And the pity of Christ in the end ruled the fate of many. We don't know the identity of this woman. The Gospel of Luke never actually tells us who the penitent woman is. But our tradition as Catholics associates her with another woman in the Gospel, Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons expelled from her, who became one of the closest companions of Jesus, she and her sister Martha, whose brother Lazarus was raised from the dead, who stood with another Mary at the foot of the cross, Mary, the mother of Jesus, an image of purity, with Mary Magdalene, an image of conversion. And it is Mary who has the first encounter of the risen Jesus and becomes the first evangelist of the resurrection to the apostles themselves. The pity of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, ruled the fate of many, not the least of which is the penitent woman, if our tradition of Mary Magdalene is true. 
In this year of mercy, it's a very appropriate set of stories that we hear. We see how disastrous it can be to be lacking in mercy in the story of King David and his downfall in the second book of Samuel. Yet we see how profitable mercy can be, not just for an individual, but for many, many people. In the story of Mary Magdalene, the penitent woman, compounded by other such imitation stories as the story of Bilbo's pity for Gollum. And we are called to remember that in this year of mercy. As Gandalf says to Frodo, there are many who live who deserve death, and many who die who deserve life. Are we to dole out that judgment? But rather we be, should be people of mercy because the mercy we exercise may in the end rule the faith of many. And we're called to remember that even in the midst of this year of mercy. To have mercy even for the most despicable people in our midst because you never know what effect that mercy might have on such people. We're not to be a people of condemnation. We may not approve of the behavior of people. Jesus even says that the woman has been set free from her sin and her sinfulness. And in other places, Jesus shows mercy. When in a, to another woman, he says, nor do I condemn you, go in peace, but avoid this sin. There's nothing sinful in being critical or being disapproving of the sins or the behavior of others. And we, of course, must be open to the correction of others toward us and our own sinfulness, our own being led astray. After all, we're all in this together as a community of faith. It's not every man and every woman for themselves. But we must look at the example of Bilbo Baggins and the Lord of the Rings. We must look to the bad example of David and the consequences of his lack of mercy. And we look ultimately to our first example in all things, the mercy of Jesus, as we are called in this year of mercy and in every year throughout our lives. And who knows, the pity of Christ exercised through us may in the end rule the fates of many.